Back in January 2020, I asked a simple question. In the expanse, how do the guns work? How might we project a kinetic round in zero-g without dislodging our own footing? And how might we harm the opposition without harming the habitat itself? However, you can't innovate alone, and ideas are not solutions, but merely questions. <laughs> In the intervening year, the residents of my comment section have offered solutions of their own, and I thought it well worth another go at this problem. After all, the ideas in the comment section are pretty good. A good science fiction will attempt to construct an immersive, believable world by not only offering an engaging spectacle of the future, but by embedding these speculative technologies into this world in a manner that is logical and self-consistent. The mark of success is that any remaining inconsistencies become very small, but in this effort, tend to become ever more acute. It's notable that when faced with poorly written work, the urge to query and resolve these remaining contradictions is nowhere near as strong as when we are faced with a masterpiece. However, the avid fan is faced with a contradiction. Enjoy the work further by investigating those remaining inconsistencies, but risk criticizing the work that everyone enjoys. My professional role is disruptive innovation and concept development, so I am able to resist everything but temptation. But rest assured, the urge to do so is because the expanse is so well researched and so well designed. These technical contradictions become few, but so marked that it is almost impossible to avoid scratching that itch. In particular, the expanse introduces a number of potential contradictions in the combination of high-speed space travel, ship-to-ship -ship combat, sophisticated heavily armoured space marines, and lots and lots of gunfights. <laughs> As much of the action takes place on civilian habitats that are sufficiently valuable to avoid simply disintegrating in the event of a dispute, close-range gunplay is common in this universe. One has to assume that neither side wish to destroy the habitat nor wish to kill the potentially unprotected inhabitants. So what kind of hand weapon might be able to harm one's opposition but not harm the habitat itself? By far the most common response to this question in the comments is that it's an invalid question. There's no problem to resolve. The solution to the problem in posed by the kinetic effect of weapon rounds penetrating the hull interior is offered by the needs of high-speed space travel itself. Now, space is big, really, really big, but it's not entirely empty, and in certain regions one may indeed occasionally encounter natural or man-made debris. If you're travelling in a tin can at thousands of miles per hour, and you hit even a small mass, it's going to cause a great deal of damage. Therefore, the hulls of these craft must be heavily armoured, or every journey will run the small risk of punching a hole right through the hull. Even the International Space Station has shields called Whipple Bumpers to protect it from debris travelling at several kilometres per second. There are several punctures on the station, and solar arrays, radiators, and trusses have scars from hits. And if an object larger than around 10 centimeters is predicted to intercept the International Space Station, they move the entire station. So, any gunfights that take place on a vessel in the expanse will be contained by the hull, because the hull is proof against hitting debris at several thousand miles per hour. However, this introduces a contradiction into the universe. If the hulls are proof against hitting debris at several thousand miles per hour, then why are they not proof against the point defense cannons that many warships carry, typically to defeat missiles, but sometimes to defeat other vehicles at close quarters? If the craft themselves are proof against slamming into debris, both natural and man-made, whilst travelling at top speed, why are they not proof against cannon rounds? What property do the gun rounds possess that rocks do not? Unless these rounds are travelling at extraordinary speed or possess some mechanism to puncture ship armour that simple debris does not, then the only way to resolve this contradiction is to assume that the small risk of impact is accepted and that the craft are unarmoured. This would make sense, as this would make vessels much lighter and therefore improve their overall performance. Which circles us back to the contradiction at hand. How do you 
have a gunfight in such a vessel without filling it with holes, losing all the gas and suffocating any unprotected civilians? How do you have a gunfight in such a vessel without damaging any critical systems that are keeping you all alive, such as pipework, electrical connections, processing power, actuation and, and crew? How do you have a gunfight in a 747 without accidentally shooting the pilot, the instruments, the flight computer, a window or the passengers? Perhaps you employ a low-powered round, much as contemporary air marshals might. Subsonic rounds, beanbags, tasers and pepper spray all offer the mechanisms to harm the occupants of a vessel without harming the vessel. This would offer an airtight, self-consistent world that leads us to Bobby Draper, gunnery sergeant of the Force Recon Group of the Martian Marine Corps. In particular, Draper is skilled in the operation of the Goliath-powered armour. Once this armour enters the narrative, we're back to square one. After all, whatever mechanism is used to protect the hull and the critical systems from gunfire is likely to offer a protective mechanism to Bobby's armour. Both the hull and the Goliath power armour suffer the very same design trade. To be as robust to impact as possible, whilst also being as lightweight as possible. Whatever you use to protect the ship's systems could protect Bobby. I suppose you could make every wall, floor, hull and casing on the ship from a couple of inches of steel. However, this is an aerospace structure. For almost all of the vessel's life, the requirement will be for lightweight and high performance, much like Bobby's armoured suit. If Bobby boards your ship, she wins, because you can't deploy a weapon against her that will not fill your own ship with big holes. In fact, under this restriction it seems that your best option is to don your own powered armour and grapple Bobby into immobility. So how do we resolve this fundamental contradiction? We wish to hurt the power armour, but not the ship. We have to hit the armour, because if we don't, the armour wins by default, as you don't dare kill it without harming your ship. We need a round that can separate this contradiction, that can discriminate between impact with the target and impact with the ship systems. And I proposed a complex mechanism that dumped all of its energy should the round miss. However, there are more elegant solutions to which my comments section led me, and I'd like to thank everyone who contributed. I'll not describe them all here, from flamethrowers to electrical effects, frangible warheads, rail guns, all splendid stuff. However, I think a very honourable mention should go to my favourite suggestion that I think is elegant and separates the contradiction between Bobby's armour and the hull very nicely. <laughs> This one is a beauty. When faced with a contradiction, we are typically faced with two benefits that we desire, but we can't have both. We want to penetrate the Goliath armor, but we want an intact hull. Unless we never miss, we can't have both because both suffer the same design pressure, light and strong. How can we distinguish between the two? How can we separate this contradiction? We can separate a contradiction in four ways. We can separate in time by having one benefit at one time and the other benefit at another time. We can have an intact hull now, but a wrecked hull and a defeated recon marine later. We can separate the contradiction by condition, by placing some filter between the two desires. For example, a mechanism to catch or slow the rounds should we miss. However, separate this contradiction by scale. We recognise that Bobby and the ship do differ vastly in one regard. They adopt different scales. The ship is very large and Bobby is relatively small. This means that a small hole in Bobby's suit would be a relatively tiny hole in the ship's hull. What is the smallest hole that you could puncture through Bobby's suit and still do Bobby harm? A 2mm hole may be just enough to harm Bobby, but would be tiny in comparison to the ship and its atmospheric volume. We minimise the harm to the ship while still doing harm to Bobby. Always look to prior art for inspiration. Armour-piercing, fin-stabilised, discarding sabot tank rounds. Long rod penetrators are a type of kinetic energy ammunition used to attack modern vehicle armour. A long, thin round concentrates the kinetic energy on a single small point, punching a small hole through the armour. Once we're through the armour, we have a wide range of options to defeat the operator, from explosive warheads, shockwaves, spreading or frangible components. You can't innovate alone, and great ideas are to be found in the spaces between people. Once a contradiction is unlocked with an elegant separation, the rest of a good idea may come flooding through. If this problem is solved with a solution that is long and thin, 
This observation leads us to also separate the contradiction in space by recognising that body armour is constrained to ensure only a small depth of penetration. Unless the armour is very large, which would defeat the object of moving through this human scale space, then only a few inches separate the external shell from the interior. This means that the long rod penetrator need only penetrate approximately four or perhaps six inches into the target. Much like the rapier in swordplay, there's no need to run an opponent all the way through through right up to the hilt. Once you are three or four inches into the target, then you've done most of the damage you need. We've found a method to discriminate between the power armor and the ship hull. For a few inches on the other side of the Goliath armor is the operator. On the other side of the ship's hull is, is nothing. If you only need to penetrate the Goliath armor by four, five, six inches to complete the task, then why does the round need to carry on its journey? In fact, it would be desirable to stop the round and avoid further damage to the ship. There's no advantage to going all the way through. Always look to prior art for inspiration, and an armor-piercing, fin-stabilized round looks like a very familiar item indeed, a nail. If this nail had a flat head on it, this would stop the round from penetrating further. And now, look what we have achieved. We have penetrated the target and subsequently plugged the hole. If this round can penetrate Goliath armor, it can penetrate the hull of the ship. However, if the tail stops this round from penetrating further into the Goliath armor, it will stop the round from penetrating right through the hull of the ship. If you want to finesse this, perhaps offer a sealing mechanism onto the underside of that nail head. Furthermore, if I wanted to protect critical systems against this nail gun, I need only put them in a suitably strong box with a suitably large air gap, about half the depth of a Space Marine's chest. This would result in a very long and very thin round with a fat tail. The 762 NATO round offers a cross section of 156 square millimeters. A contemporary long rod penetrator tank round could be approximately 30 times longer than its caliber. To occupy a similar cross section to the NATO round, what caliber would a long rod penetrator adopt? A bit of basic sums and it works out as just over two millimeters. Now we can ask a question of the expanse. We can ask a question of the production design. What is the caliber of the weapon adopted by the Force Recon Group of the Martian Marine Corps, mounted on the Goliath armor? 